Next, across the Atlantic for the news direct from the British capital. And now to London and Charles Collingwood. Good morning. This is London. British resistance at Singapore is stiffening. An authoritative London commentator said a few minutes ago that the British are counterattacking and that their counterattacks are meeting with some measure of success. It is reasonable to say, said this authoritative source, that the situation is certainly no worse and there are indications that it's better. The British are counterattacking toward their original line from which they withdrew day before yesterday. They are also attacking against the second Japanese landing to the north. A broadcast by the Malaya Broadcasting System this morning says that the Japanese are using the better part of three divisions against the Singapore defenders. The broadcast went on to declare that all useful installations in the great Singapore naval base have been blown up. Ships of the British and Dutch merchant navies are daring the almost continuous Japanese bombardment to dash in and out of the harbor, evacuating as many women and children as possible. All reports from Singapore say that the civil population are reacting with complete calm. Smoke from burning oil stores in the north of the island rises like a great pillar of black cloud by day, and by night gusts of wind whip the fires into towering tongues of flame. Against this background, the life in Singapore City provides another curious example of the way in which old habits and ways of life persist through the most fateful situations. People are going on working in Singapore just as usual. The buses and the rickshaws make their normal rounds. People dress up and go to a tea dance at the big hotel. Perhaps most surprising of all, people stand in line to get into a movie. It's hard to say just what else they might do. They would only be a nuisance in the fighting line or on the road. People in London acted the same way during the days and nights of the great German air raids. There's no particular moral attached to it. It's just surprising to see how people act while their destiny is being fought out around them. The affair of the Vichy supplies to the Axis forces in North Africa is still causing a great deal of interest and some concern here in London. Although the supplies don't seem to have been large, the British Minister of Economic Warfare confirmed in the House of Commons yesterday that they were being sent. There's been a great deal of speculation about just how these supplies get to Vichy, North Africa. Today, an authoritative London commentator suggested that they had almost certainly come in French ships. These ships were probably sent either from Italian ports or from French ports. The supplies actually got to Rommel's forces by road and rail from Tunisia. Well-informed quarters say that in view of this information, the whole question of allied relations with the Vichy government is being reconsidered. In Libya, where these French supplies are supposed to have been getting to, the Axis forces are still stalled well to the west of Tobruk. They've recovered about two-thirds of the ground which they lost to General Auchinleck without having to do any real fighting at all. However, there are indications that if they attempt to proceed any farther, they will come up against well-prepared British resistance. One of the factors in this Axis halt may well be their lack of air support. The RAF has almost uncontested air superiority over the forward area. British fighter pilots report that they are meeting with almost no opposition from the Luftwaffe. The Royal Air Force was also active in the west last night. British bombers attacked Bremen and other targets in northwest Germany, and once again, bombs were dropped on the docks at Brest. The RAF is doing its best to say that the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau stay put. This is Charles Collingwood in London, returning you to Columbia in New York. For the news in our own nation's capital, we take you to Washington for the report of Eric Severide. Today is the national holiday of Japan. Some authorities in Washington, whose job it is to carefully check the progress of the Philippine fighting each day, believe last weekend that the Japanese would try to complete the capture of the Philippine Islands in time for today's celebration. This morning it appeared that Singapore might fall before the Philippines. But there is a feeling here that the final hour of trial for MacArthur's men is now at hand. The fight for Luzon has continued 65 days. No one here any longer speaks about reinforcing the men in the Philippines. And for what material can get to the Far East, other areas with more chance have priority. There's little speculation about MacArthur's chances of evacuating. It's believed by many that the small group will first try to withdraw the, to the Corregidor Fortress in Manila Bay. That fortress probably could withstand a fairly long siege, but it's recognized that, that would be defiance without hope. As the two forces line up today, something less than 20,000 Americans and Filipinos are facing something more than 100,000 Japanese. The military problem of coping with the Japanese in the Far East has a parallel in the legal and administrative problem of coping with them on the west coast of the United States. Yesterday, a committee of Pacific Coast senators and representatives 
as did all persons of Japanese ancestry, and I would mean many who are now American citizens, be evacuated from the coast, and that individuals be, would be readmitted only on license. Mass evacuation of citizens or ousting of individuals, according to the Justice Department, would be illegal unless the land were condemned for use by the military. One solution now being discussed is a declaration of martial law in these areas. Then the Army would move citizens as well as aliens. Pacific Coast congressmen are expected to meet again tomorrow. They may ask the President to issue an executive order to carry out the evacuation they want. Another possible solution is the arrest of citizens and aliens for what is known as protective custody, arrest for their own safety. That has already been applied in two or three cases. For example, in one southwestern town, an industry had brought in Japanese workers to replace whites who had been a long time on strike. Then the war began, and it so happened that a large number of sons and brothers from that town were in the Philippines fighting against the Japanese, and a number died there. The resentment against the Japanese locally flared up, and for their own safety, the Japanese workers, undoubtedly quite innocent of any fault of their own, were gathered up and moved away. Problems more severe than the legal problems are involved. In some big Pacific areas, the Japanese grow and deliver a high percentage of the vegetables and fruits consumed. And there happens to be a nationwide campaign underway to increase food production. And by careless action, that could be harmed. Tonight, the Republicans will dine. At their annual Lincoln dinners around the country, they will work up the first flush of enthusiasm over next fall's election. Joe Martin, Jr., the Republican national chairman, said the dinners would be mostly patriotic affairs. The speakers will insist on the right of constructive criticism during more time. At the big dinner here tonight, the principal speaker will be not the last Republican candidate for president, Wendell Wilkie, but the one before that, Alf Landon. I return you now to New York. The word security, the great illusion. In every capital of the allied world, there were bitter charges that there had been too much of the illusion of security, too much complacency, too much lethargy. Australia threw away the word security. Mother India forgot it, as the Japanese opened up their all-out drive on Burma. Britannia, ruler of the waves, found that her own Straits of Dover were no longer impregnable. Singapore, with its hundreds of millions of dollars worth of fortifications, thought bitterly of that word security. And America's leaders warned, and warned again, that we are taking a licking in the Pacific. The warning came from Donald T. Nelson himself, the industrial czar of our war effort. Even America's own shores were not secure in their rock-bound distance from the enemy camp. Submarines working off those shores had proved it. It was proved again in flames, fire which swept the line of Normandy, a blaze started by carelessness. The critics of these appalling setbacks pointed to but one factor, false security and gross and utter carelessness. In London, in New York, and in Australia, carelessness was blamed in the public print for the plight of Singapore, for the victory of the German battleships Mazenau and Scharnhorst reaching the Straits of Dover, for the Normandy fire, for lack of air power. In all the highlights of the week's news, there was but one highlight for the Allies, only one bright spot, and that, the disclosure of the terrific damage wrought by the American Navy in its attack on the Japanese-held Marshall and Gilbert Islands. A couple of emperors didn't get much sleep on the night of February the 11th. Emperor Hirohito's royal head didn't touch a pillow all night. The Tokyo radio says the emperor was gripped by insomnia. So anxious was he to receive without delay the latest reports on the Japanese fighting in the city of Singapore. Emperor Hirohito could just as well have got his eight hours on the night of February the 11th. In Hsing King, meanwhile, the temperature hovered at 20 degrees below zero on the night of February the 11th. In the very coldest hours just before dawn, Emperor Kang Ti of Manchukuo got up in his bedroom, had his royal aides help him on with his royal clothes. Then, while it was still dark, Emperor Kang Ti made a cold journey to the shrine of the Japanese sun goddess. There he, too, offered his prayer for Singapore. Well, that particular morning, Emperor Kang Ti could have saved himself the trouble and turned over and grabbed an extra hour in his warm bed. Because Singapore didn't fall that day, or the next, or the next. For the British troops were busy writing their history into the proud annals of the British Empire. But critics said the reason for Singapore's invasion was not a proud chapter in anybody's history. Yes, and the critics were numerous throughout the British Empire. Those who were there say it really began at Penang, this disaster which was engulfing Singapore. Penang is a little island off the northern Malayan coast, abundant in tin and rubber. The Japanese took it in a lightning thrust. 
But how they took it was another matter. There were charges that the British had no anti-aircraft guns at Penang, that there were no fighter protections, that they hadn't even camouflaged vital area targets, and that they did not carry out a scorched earth policy in their retreat from the rich little... in their retreat from the rich little... in their retreat...